Uh, my name is Indrajit Podar. I go by the short name IP. That's my, those are my initials. I'm a senior technical staff member in IBM uh, Cloud and Cognitive Systems. And today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, enabling a hardware accelerated deep learning experience for um, Apache Spark and Hadoop uh, data science experience. Um, so essentially, what can a better hardware do for you if you're trying to do machine learning, deep learning on your data in the Hadoop clusters or, in your, or when you're using Spark? So uh, in the agenda today, what I have is um, I've got, um, I'll start with level setting, what I mean by AI, deep learning, and machine learning. And then I'm going to be talking specifically about the IBM Data Science Experience product and how um, it allows you to incorporate various different open source frameworks um, very transparently in a data scientist focused set of um, experiences and allows you to be more productive when you're trying to uh, design and experiment with your models and deploy them um, on um, your private infrastructure. Um, and then the third topic essentially is about hardware solution, about how we transparently add better hardware underneath with IBM Power Systems, and, um, and we optimize specific parts of the software stack in the deep learning and machine learning libraries using GPUs on our systems. But as a data scientist, when you're trying to deal with a lot of data and you're trying to come up with faster training times, you basically transparently get to use all these different hardware and, and fast and, uh, and lots of um, you know, storage and uh, better interconnects available in this hardware systems when they're put together into a cluster for you. So I'm going to be talking to you about how we uh, help design a better infrastructure for your data science experience. Uh, finally, I have a recorded demo. Unfortunately, I cannot do it live because I could not connect my laptop. Uh, but I do have a recorded demo to show you what I mean. Um, okay, so just to level set, we're talking about artificial intelligence, but that's really a broad term. For me, um, and perhaps for many of us, um, artificial intelligence <laughs> evokes memories of um, 2001, a space odyssey, the film, right? Uh, and there was this supercomputer at that time called HAL and turned you know, rogue on, on its masters. But that's really a very broad view of artificial intelligence, in my opinion. And from 1968, from when the movie was made until now, it's about almost 50 years, God, uh, we have come a long way. We have started applying various different machine learning techniques, which um, has evolved over these decades. And um, we have uh, started applying it on larger and larger amounts of data. And primarily because, uh, I believe, uh, Two things: there are advances in the hardware which can support these types of, you know, machine learning, uh, mathematical techniques, and it can also support very large amounts of data by using, you know, new software stacks which can scale out and distribute the training process across multiple uh, machines. Also, uh, there is this new trend towards using um, some subclasses of machine learning techniques that that I'll be referring to as deep learning techniques. Uh, they've been used by many names. And, um, but uh, the, the essential thing about these techniques are they're neural networks. They mimic how the human brain uh, neurons are connected together in different layers. Um, but what we have seen in practice is that these deep learning techniques are, um, as you give them more data to train on, the accuracy often improves much more than what you can do with traditional machine learning techniques. And that's probably why we're seeing a very large amount of interest on deep learning topics, as you can see from the Google Trends on the, on the right side. So I'm going to be talking specifically about uh, deep learning. And um, it varies a little bit from how traditional machine learning techniques have been applied over the years uh, in the, the key sense that in deep learning, it's very much, um, it's much more easier to use. You don't have to do a lot of different feature extraction. You can apply it on, on large amounts of both structured and unstructured data. And you don't have to essentially you know, do the classification on specific features that you believe are going to be responsible for your predictions. Instead, you give it the input, 
and you train, and boom, you get a, a model that you can use to predict. And it's often that simple as that, and I can show you an example. And especially with data such as image and video data, where, which is just totally unstructured, these deep learning techniques are actually finding a lot of users. Um, in this conference, this is uh, primarily a Hot and Works conference, I expect that um, there are many people who are starting out with designing these data lakes and data stores, where you do a lot of transformation and preparation of your data uh, in ETL jobs uh, using Hadoop, HDFS clusters, often NoSQL databases. But when you try to deploy, uh, when you try to create a, a machine learning or a deep learning infrastructure on top of uh, a data lake and a data store, you have to think about a few other additional layers. And those are the ones that I'm <coughs> going to be talking more about today. Um, so first off, this distributed computing layer. So in addition to just storing your data so that you're able to analyze it in distributed Spark jobs, you also have to think about um, uh, uh, additional distributed computing techniques such as Kubernetes, which is, uh, as the gentleman in, in the presentation right before me, he was talking about APIs, and that's a very central use case of using Kubernetes as an additional distributed computing infrastructure on top of or near your data lake. Um, another distributed computing technology that we use in IBM a lot, MPI, that has been a message passing interface, which has been traditionally used in high performance computing a lot. And we find very good uses of it when it comes to dealing with very large amounts of data and building these scale-out clusters across many, many nodes and many GPUs. So after you've thought about um, some of these distributed computing infrastructures, uh, the next thing is the, these deep learning and machine learning libraries and frameworks like TensorFlow, Cafe, Spark ML. Good thing is that these are all open source. And um, many of these machine learning and deep learning frameworks are um, transparently exploiting these new types of hardware that is coming along, like GPUs. So as a data scientist, when you're trying to write your program, you don't have to often know that you're, you're running them on GPUs or in these different types of infrastructure. <coughs> but you get to use that accelerated infrastructure just by simply using some of these frameworks like TensorFlow and Cafe. Then on top of these, um, deep learning frameworks, you have these APIs. Often in cloud services, you'd find that um, uh, the service provider doesn't expose the model themselves that they have trained, but they expose the APIs built around the models. <coughs> because the models are intellectual property, like Watson. Watson exposes several APIs that makes it much faster for application developers to incorporate these uh, machine learning and deep learning applications into their into the applications and, and, and their workflows. And that's the, the final layer, the application layer on top. But as, an, as we are seeing more of these trainings happening inside on-premise data structures, closer to the data where, where the data resides, we're seeing much of these APIs actually going in-house. So several of these distributed computing layers are also getting built in a very similar fashion as in public clouds, in private clouds and the applications are also getting built in these private clouds. So I'm gonna be talking about all these different layers and the infrastructure that's needed to support these different layers in addition to your data lake and data stores. So um, in summary, I think um, the two, so fundamentally in addition to the data open source frameworks like um, like TensorFlow and Cafe and Tart and Chainer, these, uh, the things that come underneath, which help in faster training times and better uh, and optimizations built for these frameworks, those are the things that, that's where the, the better hardware, um, the solid hardware and, and the optimized software come into play. And then on top of it, uh, these ease of use tools which aggregate these frameworks in manners so that you can uh, very easily create a model retrain a model, deploy a model, operationalize AI, those are the places where we have these ease of use tools which can complement these open source frameworks and provide a better overall uh, AI infrastructure. So with that, I'm gonna uh, 
I'm going to be diving a little deeper into the data science experience tool, which is where we'll start off. It's a software tool. It's targeted primarily to the data scientist persona. <coughs> and um, there's several pain points that we see um, data science teams encounter in the field today. The first and most important thing is how do you get started? Um, how do you find corporate data? How do you connect to different data sources? How do you understand the data? How do you define projects? How do you get the skills that you need? How do you ensure that the data is secure? And then as soon as you start getting, uh, after you've gotten started, and typically that's where we find most teams are quite happy with what they have today, but then, then they start experimenting with the model. They have to first clean the data, they have to <coughs> excuse me, uh, measure the accuracy. Then they have to build these data pipelines and they have to integrate with engineering and they have to not only just uh, build the pipelines but make it a repeatable process so that not only one person in the team can do it, but uh, they can build teams with many different types of skills which can then, uh, some of them could be very expensive, but those, the things that they build, the pipelines, the models, they're very repeatable. So they need to be very repeatable so that the teams can be more productive and the work can be shared across multiple team members. And once those models are built, the, 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 there's a need for deploying the models and to also monitor the models as you get more and more data. The, the, the accuracy of the model often um, deteriorates over time. And so it's important to have infrastructure which can support the model's evolution over time. So these sort of design concerns um, often have to be incorporated into a design thinking process. And we did that with our IBM Data Science Experience tool. And uh, we came, across, uh, came up with some of these um, features which, uh, which we hope that as uh, users and enterprises you'd be able to take advantage of from our experience in learning to how to address some of these pain points in the data science experience. So first off, when you log into IBM Data Science Experience, you, um, you come across a whole set of notebooks. And these notebooks are um, often available in open source in GitHub. And we have um, also provided some of these notebooks from IBM based on our interactions with various different data science teams and different enterprises and use cases. And these notebooks are a very fun way of, you know, even if you don't know the code or you don't know the technique very well, you can very easily get started using some of these notebooks and, and explore the capabilities that are available as part of the, the tool sets that come along with data science experience. And also, uh, these notebooks allow you to collaborate um, with a background, with a GitHub uh, uh, um, source code repository in your backend so that you can share your work as you do with um, uh, writing other types of code. You can also share your analysis work with other users using um, uh, the GitHub capability inside, integration available inside the science experience. And um, you can work behind your firewall by making sure that you, this whole, uh, service, it, it looks and feels like any cloud service, but it runs inside your enterprise because we deploy on top of a private cloud infrastructure using Kubernetes. And inside your infrastructure in the service, you can very easily connect to all of these enterprise data sources that, uh, that we encounter inside enterprises, not only uh, um, HDFS in Hortonworks data platform, but also big SQL databases, the traditional um, and, uh, transactional databases like DB2 and warehouses, database warehouses, uh, and you can use different protocols like Hive or HDFS to connect, uh, or you could use uh, 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 big SQL on top of these internal data, data assets, data repositories. Um, so as soon as you have got your data and you've got some example notebooks from uh, public GitHub projects, uh, the next step is you start to experiment. And that's where we provide the capability to uh, uh, use uh, these uh, uh, model experimentation phases where you can uh, you know, add new models by using a model visual builder. You can add data sets and you can 
combine these uh, open source notebooks with the, the visual capabilities that are available in, as part of data science experience to create very easy workflows for your data science teams. Um, so once you have created the model, then um, the issue comes about how do you deploy them because your models are uh, not necessarily the end product that can be consumed very easily, but the endpoints that can be created uh, by wrapping the models into a microservice, as uh, some, some of the, the team, uh, the presenter before me was talking about, uh, those microservices need to be deployed inside uh, your computing infrastructure. And that's what we do for the deployment phase. We allow creating these microservices, which deploy these models, uh, and we allow um, the, these uh, model deployments to be also version controlled with Git. And you can uh, automate the scoring of the models, you can automate the training, the evaluation of the models, and you can also um, uh, deploy not only the, the models as endpoint, but also um, things like reporting applications built with our Shiny or um, reporting with PDF and HTML and other common tools that are available as part of the notebooks. <coughs> Um, so, uh, and over time, to help improve the, the maintenance life cycle of your model, we also allow model versioning and uh, monitoring and scalability of the models. And so all of those features are available as part of TSX. And all of this is built on top of Kubernetes, and we have um, different microservices which provide these capabilities. And uh, we also include a Spark cluster inside Kubernetes to help uh, run your, uh, your training on small, smaller data sets. But um, in addition to having a Kubernetes-based infrastructure, we, um, uh, we allow connectivity to an external Spark infrastructure, uh, perhaps something that is closer to uh, your, uh, your uh, HDFS file system built on top of Hortonworks. Um, and, uh, these connectivities help you to scale your training out into multiple different clusters. <clears throat> Specifically, um, when it comes to, so all of this runs in our optimized hardware infrastructure, uh, built on the power systems, and uh, with GPUs. And the way we do uh, expose those GPUs to data scientists is that we have uh, something called an environment where you can assign different resources like uh, um, like uh, CPUs and GPU co GPUs and number of GPUs and, and a certain amount of memory. And that those resources are associated with each of the containers which are running the Jupyter Notebook server. And thereby, the, we provide a very uh, unique uh, multi-user environment and interactive environment on a container to each data scientist for them to experiment with uh, the data and build their models in the initial experimentation phase. <clears throat> but as soon as you start, once you have your initial model and you want to try to uh, run your training on a much larger data set, that's when, you, when we allow uh, connectivity through an Apache Levy server to a back-end compute grid, which uh, can be managed through uh, a scheduler like Yarn or something from IBM called uh, uh, Eagle, and, um, and scale out your training to a much larger cluster with uh, Spark. So uh, with that software architecture, um, we also, I'm gonna jump into uh, some of the ways that we uh, put the hardware acceleration uh, methods underneath the software architecture very transparently. So as a data scientist, you don't have to do anything different. Your same programs run on that accelerated infrastructure and um, often you don't even realize that you're running on the hardware acceleration with the GPUs. Um, so, <clears throat> so for uh, deployment on top of the hardware accelerator infrastructure, we, we create these different clusters and uh, we have um, um, uh, different configurations and we have a server system called IBM Power Systems LC922 where you can run, them, uh, run these Kubernetes clusters directly on the bare metal or inside virtual machines on the bare metal and uh, we have different ways of scaling out. You could take one system, create one system, and create different VM partitions, or you could add um, uh, a few virtualized systems, 
for your data science experience deployment with Kubernetes, and then add a bare metal node in addition with uh, IBM Power System AC922, which is our new Power 9 server, and there you can um, get the capability to deploy uh, these uh, compute nodes on top of a bare metal with GPUs. Um, when, uh, when it comes to deploying the, the models, we recommend having separate systems, um, and these could be, again, IBM Power Systems LC922 machines, which can only host the model endpoints, but they can be all managed as part of the same uh, Kubernetes cluster. And each of these systems, um, the unique characteristic about the system is the high-speed uh, CPU to GPU connection built on top of the NVLink uh, interconnect that was co-designed by IBM with uh, NVIDIA. And that provides a very fast bandwidth for memory transfers between the main memory and the GPU memory. And also, the, the bandwidth between the CPU and the uh, main memory of the system, each of the systems can have up to two terabytes. And all of these analysis that you see using frameworks like TensorFlow and Cafe, all of that analysis actually runs in memory. So the first thing that you have to do as a data scientist is to pull the data from a, a stationary file system into memory. And that's why the memory bandwidth is very important. And we see that when this, uh, the, when our systems with these high uh, memory bandwidth uh, capabilities, uh, the, 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 the process of pulling the data in and doing the training on top of the data in memory is much faster. Also, when we move the training off into these GPUs, which are attached to the uh, CPUs, we see that having a faster memory bandwidth available as part of the NVLink interconnect helps to uh, move the training off a whole lot faster and very transparently into the GPUs. Um, so some of the uh, proof points that we have seen you know, on top of our systems um, uh, with some uh, optimizations that we have built on, on the software for example, CAFE with large model support. Large model support is a capability that we have added on top of uh, an open source CAFE version, um, which um, helps you to uh, train model sizes which do not fit within the memory of a GPU. As you know, um, a GPU at this point, the latest one with, from NVIDIA, the Volta 100, that has up to, I think, uh, 16 or 32 gigabytes of memory. But if you uh, sometimes build models which are bigger than that in size and can't fit all the data into one GPU. And there, you need to transfer memory, uh, the GPU from the, the memory from the GPU memory to the CPU memory. And the large model support capability helps you with that. And we've seen that training times uh, go up to four times faster, up to 3.8 times faster with the, with the uh, uh, NVLink interconnect that's available as part of the um, um, IBM Power Systems family. Um, uh, I was talking to you about MPI, and uh, we have a capability called distributed deep learning, which allows you to scale the training out to a very large number of nodes. Uh, we have scaled out to, uh, in IBM Research, we have scaled out to about uh, 256 GPUs on 64 systems, and that brought the training time down from 16 days to about seven hours. And, uh, uh, and so and scaling was near ideal because uh, we're seeing that as we added more GPUs, we were able to scale almost linearly uh, with, for, for the training. And this was happening because of the MPI uh, libraries that we used and of the Mellanox Infinity Band adapters that we used and uh, the distributed deep learning capability that uh, we used to scale out the training. Uh, and this is one of the configuration that we used uh, from a hardware perspective to build out the, the DDL cluster. Um, there's also uh, capabilities uh, available for automatic hyperparameter tuning. So when it comes to training neural networks, um, there are often many parameters. And, and getting the right set of parameters for those neural network is often called a black art. And so uh, what is done is often times you will see people running multiple trainings with different parameter configurations and uh, come up uh, with a, a recommendation on what are the best set of parameters to do your training uh, the way so that you can get to the highest amount of ac accuracy. And so that auto hyperparameter tuning process is uh, built into some of our software capabilities in, um, in the IBM uh, Power AI stack. 
<coughs> and, and that's available as part of IBM Spectrum Conductor with Spark and Power AI Enterprise. Also, we have built some optimizations for um, the SkyKit Learn uh, Python package, which allows you to transparently exploit the GPUs uh, available in the system for uh, traditional machine learning type of uh, applications. And we have seen that when, with some of these optimizations, <coughs> compared to a Google Cloud using only CPUs, you could get done with your training sometimes about 46 times faster um, with power and GPUs available for your training. So this is the kind of hardware solution that we can provide on top of our systems. And, um, uh, and this is particularly useful when you're trying to deal with data which is uh, uh, very large in volume, like for example, video data or image data. So we have a product called Power AI Vision where we deal with uh, specifically uh, object detection problems and uh, image classification problems. And when this product runs on top of our power systems family, uh, we can actually do a lot of uh, uh, object detection pretty fast on top of these systems. Um, so with that, I'm going to switch to a, a small demo of um, data science experience running on these power systems. And you can see how uh, transparent uh, Oops. Okay. So this is IBM Data Science Experience, local, running on power systems. I'm logging into the Data Science Experience uh, tool. It's running on Kubernetes in your private cloud en environment. Um, and uh, so the first thing you'd see are the set of notebooks that are available to you. And this is version 1.2.03, that is uh, the latest one. PPC64LE indicates the hardware architecture, which is power. And first thing I'll show you is the set of environments that are available as part of uh, the data science experience local when running on power. And in particular, uh, the, power, uh, the Jupyter with Power AI environment, that allows you to specify uh, GPUs in addition to CPUs. And here I have specified uh, add one GPU to your environment. And when you uh, do that and start your environment, you're now ready to run your notebook in an environment with a GPU. So now it's starting up. <coughs> Okay, so now it's running, um, and then uh, now we're going to go into the, a project, which is the central concept in data science experience local. And here I have a project with a number of notebooks available. I'll take a notebook which, is, which came from open source, uh, the cafe repository, and I'll open it in that GPU environment. Um, GPU environment with the Power AI set of uh, optimized libraries. And here I will run it with um, the optimized cafe version from the Power AI libraries with the GPUs. Um, first thing I'll do is I'll run NVIDIA SMI, which is a very common tool used for, uh, uh, for integrating the GPUs that are available in a system. Here the NVIDIA SMI tool is running inside a container and shows that there's one GPU that is available in that container. So now I'm basically running through the uh, notebook steps. The first thing loads cafe, and then um, it loads a model, a pre-trained model uh, for cafe, and uh, and sets the mode to the first the CPU mode, uh, and then loads uh, up uh, the model into memory. Download first to download the, the pre-trained model from a model zoo. Uh, available with Cafe, it's open source model. And then it loaded the model into memory inside the container. And then we're going to do a simple classification. Here's a picture of a um, cute little cat. 
And uh, it's easy for us humans to say it's a cat, but with that pre-trained model, we can uh, do a prediction very quickly. Uh, and, <clears throat> and after we do the prediction, we look, uh, that, that's the step of the prediction. And there you can see the label that it found for that predicted class, which is a tabby cat. And that is uh, the correct prediction. Um, but the uh, thing that is interesting for us here is that in order to run this prediction using a GPU, we will switch from a CPU mode to a GPU mode by just simply two lines of code, cafe set device uh, zero and uh, a GPU mode, and then we'll run the prediction. <clears throat> And you'll see that when you run it with the CPU, it took us about 2.5 se five seconds. But when running with the GPU, it took us only about 10.5 milliseconds with only two lines of code changes. That's about 243 times faster. And so that's the kind of acceleration that we provide on the infrastructure. And this uh, very transparently provided to you as a data scientist because you don't really have to change any code. You just have to specify a few things in the flags. Uh, and that is essentially uh, what I have for the demo. Uh, I'd like to just, uh, I just realized I was showing you the wrong version of the slides. Uh, I have one more thing that I wanted to uh, share with you, um, which is uh, some performance benchmarks which our team came up with. Uh, and so, uh, on internal benchmarks, uh, we, have, we, we tried running uh, k-means clustering with 15 gigabytes of data uh, for four concurrent users in Data Science Experience Local um, on power systems, AC, power AC922, and compared that with uh, a comparable Intel system and found that essentially we, the training on that 15 gigabyte data set, experimental data set, uh, could be done about in half the time it took for all four concurrent users uh, when using the, uh, one GPU per user. Um, and also, um, if you're not using the GPUs, if you're only using the CPUs, you could, we found that we could, uh, using a one gigabyte data set, we were able to scale up, uh, accommodate up to about eight users concurrently on our systems compared to only about four users on the Intel X66 system. So it's either twice the number of system, twi twice the number of concurrent users, or half the time it took to do the training. Um, and um, also wanted to point out some of the uh, pricing um, information. So uh, our systems are priced very competitively compared to comparable Intel, Intel systems. So in terms of price performance, we are about 2.2 times uh, better than the Intel systems because lower server cost compared with faster training times. Um, and so uh, that is basically it uh, for today. If there are any questions, I'm ready for them. Thank you.